comes and wipes nearly half of the population or something. And that you know, when you try to they probably you borrowed the money or something. Then after you start telling people that ah that cat farming is nonsense and it's this this is that is all all that. It becomes really really a bad experience for you. But if you if you are interested, if you've always loved farming or catfish farming or something, even when you, you have issues, you'd be you keep motivating yourself like, oh, now I know where the problem was. Okay, next time it's not going to be like this. Okay, next time I know I'm not supposed to put my fingerlings directly into this eating pond or something. Maybe next time I'm supposed to first put them in a nursery or something. Because you have the passion. So you see it as a learning process. That is when you cannot start thinking of profitability. Yeah, it's some you know, it's sometimes inevitable for all these things to happen. As much as we don't pray for it, sometimes it's inevitable. And like every other business in the world, it has its pros and cons. Like you need to be interested, you need to be involved, you need to be ready to learn and unlearn before you can be a profitable catfish farmer. That's just it. Because um, Rome was not built in a day. So another thing that I said I was going to talk about is marketing and feasibility. Yeah, people will say, ah, why marketing first? You, not, you don't have product. Yeah, that's where many people go wrong. In this thing called catfish business. Like, a lot of people will be surprised, like, this is coming before other points. There is a saying, forward, forewarned is forearmed. Like, once you've been warned earlier, that you've been really, really armed towards whatever is coming. Many people go into farming without marketing and feasibility. Oftentimes, most of the time, they fail. Or at least run at loss. Or worse off, they, they won't make profit. Yeah. Because you have to check for available markets and their demands, both within and outside your community. You have to know your target market. You have to have a list of available markets and produce to their specification and demand. For instance, right now, I know some people that um, they were into catfish farming before, but somehow they had access to some input, supply, loan, what have you, and they delved into it. They've not even really had a customer base before. They were already so reliant, like, oh, them, the what have you, of takers will be coming to pick it. Now the pandemic, everything is here. They, they are running helter skelter. They don't know how to go about it. So tell me, after this pandemic, if you ask them what is their experience with catfish, and what would they say? They will tell you it's a really terrible business. That's what they're going to say because they don't know the nitty gritty of this business. They didn't do market survey. They didn't do marketing. They just felt like once I have, I have fish and water, no problem. Once I tell people that I have fish to sell, they will come and pick it. So sometimes it's not always like that. Sometimes technicalities happen. Sometimes things that we do not envisage come into play. And we do not have so much option than to find alternative routes so if you've not been doing marketing if you've not been doing um feasibility you might not know how to go about it like you wouldn't know what to do with your fish or with whatever else happens anything can happen the market changes like every day the world evolves a lot of technologies come into play a lot of um systems come into place so after that i i would then talk about niche selection you said this catfish business is broad, broader than you can think of. There's more to just producing. It's not just everybody can just be producing. If everybody produces, who's going to consume? Who's going to do the other aspects of it? So there's a whole lot of um, job opportunities in catfish farming without even you even having to cultivate fish. So that's where niche selection comes in. You need to understand the various excuse me, niches in catfish business and stick to one or at most two for starters. Don't try to be a jack of all trades and master of none. Especially if you, you've you not been um, used to that, uh, to the industry before maybe you've not studied it in school before and had those contacts or learned some things about it. Maybe you just, as a business person, you just said, I want to go into catfish production or catfish um, value chain. You have to study the niches that are available in cats. Of course, these niches are intertwined. So most of the time, especially after your first attempt, you don't really have to strictly limit yourself to one niche. But just the major part is understanding that you can't just do everything at once. Even people who have multimillionaire and want to run uh, the business on the very large scale, I don't advise them to do everything all at once. Like You have to be cognizant of these things. Um, okay, so um, there are so many niches, fine. The first and most important and most sensitive 
niche. Every niche is important, but why I say it's the most important, it's just like, um, it's the, you know, life is the most important, like, entrance into life. That is the hatchery and breeding. So you see that, because truth is, without hatchery and breeding, we won't have the other aspects of it. Yeah. So the hatchery and breeding niche is one important aspect that you can go into, but it involves a lot of technicality. It's the process that, uh, you know, it's more technical than it sounds, and it should be treated as a separate topic. Like, it's something we would have to even treat separately, but I'll just tell you about it briefly now. Because um, it's it's like um, gathering um, matured fish, that's the breeding aspect, gathering mature fish, mature fish, that have certain traits that you want to be in your hatchlings then they'll be fed on feed formulated specifically for gonad development gonad development is developing the reproductive system it's not the same feed they should be eating just like if a woman is trying to conceive or something maybe some cultures i don't know and some people do this thing like when a woman is going to get married very soon they'll start feeding her on some things using some things on her body just so that she would be reproductive you understand so it's just like that too we prepare them for reproduction purpose we stop feeding them for fattening purpose or for commercial purpose we start preparing them for production purpose so and there's what we call selective genetic breeding it's a technical term and process in which experts pick parent stock with certain preferred dominant traits cross them to achieve certain results and fit it's more like i said it's more complicated or more technical and it's a topic that should be treated separately but basically what i just want you to know in this session is that that, that, that is one niche you could carve for yourself you could go into hatchery or, and breeding that is where life actually starts in catfish farming that's one aspect of business of course a lot of people are breeders and still do other other aspects or a lot of people just base specifically on uh, the hatchery and breeding in, alone it depends on you it depends on your level of knowledge it depends your on your extent of interest and exposure to knowledge it depends on your target market as well i'll still go deep into that so um then we have the grow out that is the the aspect where people buy and some people are strictly grow out businessmen they come to the hatchers and breeders to buy fish that they want to grow out for consumption whereas some hatchers and breeders also do grow out once they are they are their are, are hatchlings have been bred and all that they sell some they stock some in their grow out and burn so you see it's intertwined it's not like um everybody just has to be strictly on its own or something so um it involves buying fish seeds such as fingerlings or juveniles to rare in a cultured medium and um, cultured medium may be plastic ponds, tarpaulin, concrete, etting pond, and it can also be read in a cage culture on water bodies such as dams. That's another aspect of grow out. It's called cage aquaculture. So the size you intend to grow will de depend on your financial capacity, yes, on your stocking, your stocking level, and your target market. How much money do you have? Because catfish consume a whole lot of food. Yeah. And oftentimes, it's better you already have the money you want to use to feed this fish till end. Or you already have a sure source of money to feed this fish to end. So this also will determine the size of fish you want to grow. If you know you only have money to grow for to, to feed for three months, you already know the kind of the size of fish you, will, you would feed for three months. If you can feed for as much as six months, you already know the, si the, the quantity of feed you would need for six months. And also your, your target market also. You understand now, if you're selling to people from, who come all the way to the south, to the southwest from Asabonisha, you don't expect that you want to start selling 300 to 500 grams of fish to them. Those ones, the regular um, um, market people on, in, your, in your vicinity can come and pick those ones. You don't have to go all the way to feed, you understand? So those three things have to come into place. Your financial capacity, your stocking yes and your target market so it's important to have a specific target market before growing your fish and to be sure you have the financial provision to feed till target harvest i know a lot of people that they thought of oh, i'll rough it i'll rough it somehow somehow but you know a lot of things can happen to your finances and before you know it you have fish and water you're unable to feed them then you start feeding them drums going to get a what do you call water and all that giving them 
Fine, I know it's, it's some people cannot avoid them giving substitute feed to fish, but that should not replace the main feed because people who produce this feed and formulate them are not fools. They are selectively formulated feed and added one or two things in the right proportion. Just the basic requirements that your feed, fish need without having to do with carcasses, dealing with remnants you want to throw off, dealing with remnants that will pollute your water and all that. That is even another topic entirely again. So you see, like I said, catfish farming is broad. But of course, we'll get there. Like With time, the more we talk about it, the more we pick topics and discuss, the more we know about it. So um, there's this aspect again, which is preservation and processing. Like I said, um, every niche doesn't have to just stand on it. So like, it's a value chain. But just to not put yourself into troubles, especially if you're a beginner or you have limited funds. That is why these niches are separated and still interlinked. So you can play in one, you can play in two, you can double around, but with a mindset. So um, it's the part where harvested fish is preserved or processed for storage or later use. It can be done by grower producers or other business investors. Some people don't even, they don't grow fish, they don't hatch fish. Hmm? They don't grow, they don't hatch. Their own is to come and do business. Those ones, they are even the people I give most are like, those ones are business enthusiasts. They already know how it works and they find ways around it. Like, they just come to buy fish. They already have the facilities for preserving or processing and they already have a target market. They want to they want to sell it to and they also there's another thing in that business also like no regular farmers who grow out can also come and preserve or process there at certain costs like if they don't have the facilities with them in their own farms they could come and pay tokens also to preserve and to process there so it's another business entity so there's the freeze blasting which is a major system of preservation like especially for export purpose just the way they freeze fish from the the imported fish to us that is just the same way because there are some markets that need the fish fresh but they are far away from producers who can't afford um mortality waste and all that so it's 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 freeze blasted to preserve for that market then there's the smoke or oven drying of course that one is like process you process the fish remove everything smoke it and all that uh, target markets for that to supermarkets individuals and all that then there's still the fillet yes and there's the barbecue the the not it's not exactly preserved but it's processed like okay for your almost immediate consumptions this is popular in um um in phone centers and what are the bars and all that so that's another business even the barbecue man it's doing it he doesn't even rare fish it's also doing that business on this one there's so many aspects to catfish farming we have the marketing and the sales yeah you know yeah this this niche you know i was saying something initially that um, you have to do marketing you have to do feasibility this is where it comes in there are some people that they don't even go they don't even know how to rear fish their own is marketing and sales they come they help you market your product they help you sell your product we have the supermarkets we have um all those other institute institutions that they don't exactly go to farm to rare fish but they are still making money out of um, catfish business. That's another one. It's a broad aspect of catfish, fam catfish farming business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Without growing fish, you can be in the agribusiness value chain just by marketing and selling catfish, either live or processed. You can liaise with farms in your location to help and all that. You There's so much that um, you can do. Sorry, excuse me. So we have um we still have other aspects of the business, but I won't be talking much about it. We have the recycling and circular economy, we have the feed and the nutrition, we have the research aspect of it. But um because um there's there are so many other things I would like to discuss here today. Okay, um there is there are some processes I want to discuss now. The first is site selection. This is especially if you want to go into production per se. So site selection, it, de it depends on so many things. One, availability and quality of water. Water is life. Water is the fish habitat. The fish lives, drinks, 
excretes breathes in its water so the importance of water and its parameters and um, what have you and the degree of availability of water cannot be overemphasized not all sites are good for aquaculture business water availability non flood prone in area not deeply slopey topography land far from industrial effluent 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 waste these are some factors that you have to consider while selecting sites in fact the source of water available in on this site determines other things such as the type of pond you construct the kind of fish production you're going to there are some sites that you should not even bother doing hatchery yeah because of the the kind of water you are going to find there except you have to start setting up future plants and all that again so these things go they are intertwined and they go a long way i know so many people that they just go I had that fish farming is this is that if they once they call you and they want to consult and all that and you say um okay sir this and this are what we have to do but you have to pay so they just say ah oh, don't mind that person I've read enough online and she's judging me this judging me that I'll go do it by myself at the end of the day they still come back to call because they've gone about it the wrong way some even dig ponds where there's so much heavy mineral in the water and the fish begin to maybe die or have stunted growth or some a lot of things could happen. So it's best you get enough knowledge from people who have the experience, who understand this thing. Sometimes people might be lucky, of course. Maybe somebody might just go and dig up a pond around the stream of his house. Maybe it's just lucky. First, second production. He might be lucky and be able to break even a little. Even at that, it's not getting his maximum productivity, but he doesn't know because it feels like he's done it right. It's, just, it's only nature that has just smiled on him. That's just it. And it's for a limited time. Afterwards, especially when he finally gets unlucky to to stock fish that um, have issues with their genetics, that is when he will start having the problem. Then if at that moment he had changed feed or something, you say, oh, it's the feed I changed, it's this. But the genetic composition of the present fish is, is very, will not, uh, will not um, resist most of the things that the previous ones resisted from the poor water quality or poor soil quality of the pond or something. So it's complicated, it's intertwined, but it's very easy once you learn the basics, once you learn from people who understand and put some things in mind. So for instance, if the site has groundwater source and retain retainable soil, it's best to go for a thin pond. If there isn't sufficient groundwater, you may have to dig out boreholes and erect structures like concrete ponds. If you want to do this in your enclosed compound and you have good work, you may decide to use trampoline. You know, some people just want to do some. I just want to do some fish at my backyard. You just make some trampoline or put some plastic tanks, especially if it's not your own building or something. So there is ways to eat, but it's important to think about the availability and quality of water on the site you want to select. Then now goes when you've ascertained the quality and quantity of water available on the site you can start thinking of pond type so like i've entered the water source the site location the soil type the production size etc will determine the type of pond you will erect ability of pond to drain water under gravity is important even if water can go into the pond under gravity as well to reduce cost so for instance you want to run a small production in your backyard compound you can either install trampoline or plastic tanks you can also use concrete tanks, depending on if you own the house. Then you have a piece of land in the swamp. The best thing is to construct earthen ponds with inflow and outflow systems. Like there's the inflow, there's the outflow. The inflow is like a tad bit higher, the outflow. So you just know that the, the ground is giving you natural water. And you know, especially if it's the muddy kind of soil that retains. You know, catfish itself is originally a mud fish. The African catfish, yeah. They love to swim in mud, to play in mud and all that. So it's that's very easy. Like once you construct the ponds, you bag them and all that. You just have the inlet and outlet. The groundwater is seeping in. The another part is seeping out so that um, there won't be an overflow or a flood. That's by it. Then um, you um, there is this one too. For instance, you could have your ponds around the um, water body like dam. Like there is. Let me use the typical asset dam in a lorry. There are thousands, thousands, thousands of farmers farming around Asadam in the lorry. All they do is they dig out the ponds, 
they have pumping um, machines that pump out water from the acid dam into their ponds. They do the pumping, pumping, and they do water exchange system there. That's another way. But um, I, the cheapest is still the one who has to use ground groundwater. But not everybody has that um, a leverage to use groundwater. Not every ground, not every ground can can do that as well. So that's by it. Then we have to talk about pond preparation. Pond preparation varies depending on the type of pond, and it's really another topic entirely. Yes, I would keep saying everything is another topic entirely. Like it is, it is. Oftentimes with plastic or trampoline tanks, all we need to do is wash. Most of the plastic or trampoline tanks have been um, conditioned in a way that they don't they don't um they don't emit any chemicals into the water. So once you wash off and you rinse and put condition it with the kind of water you're going to be using to rear the fish, oftentimes you're good to go. For concrete ponds too, you ensure it is well screeded and the surface is smooth. Yeah, because if the surface is not smooth, the fish would um would 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 um, injure themselves over time on the rough patches. You know, they will play in water, they will do all the sorts, they will swim around. Especially on days when you're draining the water. So you have to be cognizant to put to cognizant of that. Then um you could you could to prepare because most of the time, you know, it's it's being cemented. Like they use cement on the surface and all that. And you know cement to it's uh, it's chemical. So what you do is you soak you could soak it after um after the construction, you could soak it with water for two days. Then you could fertilize with dry them, dry them poultry waste. There's all the, the packets and sacks. Soak it to neutralize the the effect of the chemical in the pond. You can soak for four to seven days with dried poultry manure in sack parts. Then you wash off. You can also soak it with water till it turns green. But that takes a longer time. Like maybe if you don't want to use the pond immediately. You can do that but if you quickly want to stop the pond it's better to go for the for the use of um poultry manual and all that then the earthen pond the earthen pond is full of microbes remember it's soil very fertile soil like very organic soil it's going to be full of microbes that can harm your fish so experienced farmers can use chemicals to deactivate these microbes but it's risky so that's why i say experienced farmers it's risky because any slight um any slight trigger, anything that can kill the microbes can kill your fish, especially the young fish, the juveniles and all that, that you want to stock. So you have to be careful. In fact, I don't advise people to. But for those who are experienced and know how to go about it, cool. So it's risky and it's tricky. And I'm not, naturally, I'm not a fan of chemicals when it comes to fish production, except when there is no other option. So uh, anything that can kill microbes can kill your fish, especially the young ones. Oftentimes, it's best to use natural fertilizers. On the pond some people also they line with chemical free tapolin but another thing the another um downside to lining the the earthen pond with tapolin is this i see it as sometimes except it's really necessary it's more like waste of resources waste of money and your you have um killed the main peck to earthen pond because your earthen pond in as much as it has microbes once you're able to attack the microbes it gives your fish substitute, substitute um, feed. Aside the feed you feed your fish, your fish also gets something to eat from the eating pond. Yes. So if you now, even if God has finally blessed you to be able to acquire a land where you can use the eating pond, you now still have to go invest money into lining again with trampoline. The aim has been defeated, but of course, sometimes desperate... Um, Situations require desperate measures. I can understand that there is no one rule or one size fits all in catfish farming. Like this, is just giving an idea of things. So basically, most of the time, that's that's the basic and um, pond preparation. And there 